lessons from the Reformation and this evening's presentation we are looking at the monk Martin Luther and we're going to begin as we have done previously with a scripture Acts chapter 20 verses 28 to 30 which kind of set the scene for what we're looking at and why it was necessary for there to be a reformation because the Bible writers saw into the future and they saw that other teachings would creep into the church and attempt to change the Word of God. And so the verses in Acts chapter 20 say, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw disciples after them. Well, in the last presentation we were looking about the story of Jan Hus, or John Hus as we know him, and how he had been one of the first. He had followed in the footsteps of John Wycliffe and was fighting against the errors and the problems that were coming in to the church. And now we're going to leave Bohemia. We're going to leave the Czech Republic and move across to Germany. And when we get there, we are in 1505 and there was a young law student on his way back to Erfurt from his family home in Mansfeld by the name of Martin Luther. He passed through a forest during a thunderstorm. A lightning bolt uh, crackled right next to him and scared him to such an extent that he promised to devote himself to God should God spare his life. And he prayed to one of the saints and said, Help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. Well, of course, he was helped. Uh, I believe it was by God rather than by St. Anne. And a few days later, he entered into the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. The gloomy, superstitious ideas of religion that were then prevailing filled Martin Luther with fear. He would lie down at night with a sorrowful heart, looking forward with trembling to the dark future and in constant terror at the thought of God as a stern, unrelenting judge, a cruel tyrant, rather than a kind heavenly father. But from Bohemia, the truth was spreading to Germany. Many students had come home from the University of Prague, having been taught there by Professor Jan Hus, and they brought his teachings with them to Germany. And for Martin Luther, he was, as I say, in fear of the Lord. This was what filled his heart, and it enabled him to maintain a steadfastness of purpose, and also led him into a deep humility before God, but he had this abiding sense of his dependence upon divine aid. And so every day he did not fail to begin the day with prayer. While his heart was continually breathing a petition for guidance and support, he said, to pray well is the better half of study. But it wasn't just in areas of prayer that Roman Catholic theology uh, required more than that for an entrance into heaven. There was to be a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. Now the church said that you may well have been forgiven your sins, but still there is the temporal, there is the earthly or worldly punishment that you must receive as well. And these earthly punishments will remove either in part or in total the punishment that was due to come for sin. So in other words, if you punished yourself on this earth in this life, you would not have so much punishment when you died. 
those who died in grace, said the church, but have not yet fulfilled the temporal punishment due to their sin, can do so in purgatory. Now, purgatory was this supposed place where the soul would go in between heaven and hell, where it would be punished for all of the sins. So, in other words, even though one might give one's life over to Christ, one might confess all one's sins to Christ, that wasn't enough. The atonement of Christ wasn't enough. You had to be punished as well. So Luther spent his time trying to atone for his sins through menial and debasing tasks. And he, he did this every opportunity that he had. He led a most rigorous life. He fasted. He held vigils. He scourged himself with a whip to subdue the evils of his nature, from which the monastic life had brought no relief. And he shrank from no sacrifice by which he might obtain that purity of heart that would enable him to stand approved before God. Luther said himself, I was indeed a pious monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can express. If ever monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. If it had continued much longer, I should have carried my mortifications even to death. Martin Luther went through the extremes of painful discipline. He lost strength. He suffered from fainting spasms, uh, from the effects of which he never fully recovered in the rest of his life. But with all his efforts, his burdened soul found no relief. He was at last driven to the verge of despair. When it appeared to Luther that all was lost, God raised up a friend and a helper for him. The pious Stalpitz opened the word of God to Luther's mind and bade him look away from himself, cease the contemplation of infinite punishment for the violation of God's law, and look to Jesus, his sin-pardoning saviour. Stalpit said this, he said, Instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favour. Love him who first loved you. In spite of the fact that people were caught up in this idea of paying atonement for their sins, there were still messengers of mercy such as Staupitz, and Staupitz's words made a deep impression upon Luther's mind. After a struggle with long-cherished errors, he was enabled to grasp the truth, and peace came to his troubled soul. Luther found a Bible that was chained to the wall, and he opened it up and began to read the Word of God for himself. And soon he began to discover some of the truths in that Word. Meanwhile, Luther was led to travel to Rome. Now, of course, the way that he went to Rome from Germany was to travel on foot. And so he decided that he would go and visit the home of the church. He entered the city, visited the churches, listened to the marvellous tales repeated by priests and monks, and performed all the ceremonies required. Everywhere he looked upon scenes that filled him with astonishment and horror. He saw that iniquity existed among all classes of the clergy. He heard indecent jokes from prelates and was filled with horror at their awful profanity, even during Mass. As he mingled with the monks and the citizens, he met dissipation, debauchery. Turn where he would, in the place of sanctity, he found profanity. He went on to say, No one can imagine what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. 
Thus, they are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence issues every kind of sin. Now, whilst he was there, Luther was led to go to Pilate's staircase. A recent pronouncement had been made by the Pope that there would be an indulgence for anybody who would climb that staircase on their knees. Now, an indulgence means a release from the penalty of sin in purgatory. And so Luther went to Pilate's staircase. Now, you may have noticed the name is Pilate's staircase. Why? Well, because this was supposed to have been the staircase that Jesus descended by when he left the Roman judgment hall. And according to tradition, this had been miraculously conveyed from Jerusalem to Rome. Angels had lifted it up and moved it to Rome. And so now Luther came, and while in the, in the process of earning his indulgence by going on his knees and climbing up the stairs, suddenly he appeared to hear a loud voice saying in his ear, The just shall live by faith. Now this was a quotation from Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Springing to his feet, Luther looked around horrified. Who had just shouted this into his ear? But he could see no one that could have said such a thing. No one that was close enough to have said it in a loud voice, but yet not be seen. Luther ran in shame and horror from that place. Well, he returned from Rome and accepted a doctorate at Wittenberg University and devoted himself to studying and preaching the scriptures. And this course of action would lead Luther to an irrevocable split with Rome. Now, the main issue of the split was the doctrine of indulgences. This caused Luther to launch his attack, which caused his final separation from the church. There was a man by the name of John Tetzel. Now, John Tetzel was moving from town to town selling indulgences. Now, as I said before, an indulgence is a release from the penalty of sin. So what Tetzel would do was he would set himself up and then he would say to people, your parents, your dead parents, are now suffering in purgatory because of the sins that they have committed. However, if you pay some money, I will give you a release from that debt of sin. In fact, there was a rhyme that was sung at that time. And if I quote a rough translation from the German into English, the, the song would go, When the coin into the coffer doth ring, the soul from purgatory shall spring. Everybody was told that to save your parents from suffering, spend your money, give your money, your life savings even, to the church, and in return they will get release from that suffering. And then when you finish paying for your parents, you might want to think about aunts, uncles, grandparents, as far back as you can remember your ancestors. Do you want them to be suffering in purgatory when you can release them by spending some money? And so this was how money was being raised. And in fact, the money was being raised to build St. Peter's Church in the Vatican. They decided they wanted to build this grand church, but it would be built on the backs of the guilt of the poor. One day Tetzel was moving from one city to the next, and as he was going through woods on horseback, suddenly a man approached, drew his sword, pointing his sword at Tetzel. He said, give me your money. One would imagine it would be the old phrase, your money or your life. Tetzel looked at the man. He said, do you understand? Do you know? Do you realize who I am? And the man replied that he cared not. Either give over the money or lose your life. And Tetzel said, this is not my money. This is God's money. And the man still, it made no difference at all. He demanded that Tetzel hand him over the money. In fear for his life, Tetzel did that and then 
was allowed to continue on his journey. When he got to the next town, he immediately went to the sheriff there and explained what had happened. And whilst he was in the midst of describing this terrible ordeal he'd undergone and the robbery that had ensued, suddenly Tetzel looked up and saw the very villain that had robbed him in the forest. He pointed him out to the sheriff and the man was swiftly arrested to be taken before the magistrates as soon as possible. When he was there before the magistrate, the magistrate asked him the first question. Did you commit this crime? The man was very open, in fact rather blasé about it, when he said, oh yes, I did it, I committed the crime. The judge said it was such a heinous crime to be robbing not just men, but robbing God as well. And so he said to the man, do you have anything at all that you could possibly say to me in mitigation before I pronounce sentence on you? The man was unwavering, he stuck his hand inside his jerkin and he pulled a parchment outside of his jerkin which he then gave to the judge. The judge opened it up and he saw that there was an indulgence that the man possessed. It was a pardon. It was a pardon for the sin of robbery and theft. The man declared, I have already been pardoned by God for the crime that I have committed, so how can you now condemn me? The judge recognised the rightness of what the man said, and he had to agree that if God had already given him pardon, he could not punish him, and so the man went free. Now all this goes to show the ridiculous, the stupidity of this idea of penance, that you could pay for the sins of others in the past, you could pay for your own sins, you could even buy forgiveness for sins of the future. It reminds us of Matthew chapter 21 verses 12 and 13, when Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so it was in the Middle Ages, and still it remains today, because the doctrine of purgatory, the doctrine of penance, still remains in the Catholic Church to this day. Luther, incensed by what was going on, it was the doctrine of indulgences that caused him to launch his attack which would cause his final separation from the church. Now, Luther, like the other reformers before him, did not want to bring down the church. He didn't want to separate from the church. It's called a reformation because they, they wanted to reform the church. And so Martin Luther wrote out 95 theses or 95 arguments against the doctrine of indulgences, and this he nailed to the door of Wittenberg University Church. Luther then set in motion a reformation in thinking that would restore salvation by grace over salvation by works. Luther's actions were soon condemned. The, the Pope wrote out a bull condemning Luther, but Luther took the bull and threw it into the fire, that the people were to be taught to look to the Saviour alone for salvation, not through indulgences, penances, not from the works of men or priests, not even from the Pope. He taught the Bible maxim, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. The excitement that Luther felt uh, as he discovered these gospel truths had a profound effect upon him. And he said that he felt entirely born again and was led through open gates into paradise itself. Suddenly the whole of scripture had a different appearance for me. I recounted the passages which I had memorised, and I realised that other passages too showed that the work of God is what God works in us. Thus St Paul's words that the just shall live by faith did indeed become to me the gateway to paradise. 
Now, whilst Luther was discovering all of this, his writings, his words and his actions did not go unnoticed by those in Rome. In 1517, salvation by grace was brought forward by Luther. He, he following on from Romans 1.17, which says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And there were those words that echoed through his mind on his knees, climbing the steps in Rome, the just shall live by faith. But Luther was brought before the church. He was condemned. He was, in fact, having to answer for his belief in the Bible. As he stood before the church, he said, Here I stand, I can do no other. He said that he relied solely and totally on sola scriptura, on the Bible and the Bible only. The righteousness of faith through the grace of God, became the foundation of the Reformation. And indeed, the Reformation was built on five solas, as we may call them. Here are the, the five solas. Sola Scriptura, that is the, the word of God only. Sola Fide, the justice of God only. Sola Gracia, the grace of God only, soli Christus, Christ only, and soli gloria Dei, glory to God alone. And it was these five that shaped the Reformation. Luther began with sola scriptura and challenged the metaphor of church superiority. With sola fide, God's justice only, he countered the sale of indulgences, and this led to sola gracia, that it was God's grace only that brings remission from sins. He discovered that the justice that God requires is the justice that is freely given, not something that is paid for. And then only grace, sola gracia, this became the foundation of righteousness by faith. It was to be only Christ, nothing above Christ. The papacy certainly was not to be placed above Christ, and all glory should be given to God alone. None of that glory was reserved for the church. These five solas are in fact found in the three angels' message and comprise the message of our church today. But we introduce another sola into that message. We bring in what I might paraphrase as solus Christus modum, Christ's method alone. Because when we go out one another to spread the gospel, we are following Christ's method of go ye therefore, teaching everyone. Whereas the church in the time of the Reformation was hiding the word of God, was hiding the teachings of Christ, we open those teachings up, we open up the word, and using that word we go out to bring the repentant sinner to Christ. The church cannot save anyone. It is only Christ and faith in his all-sufficient grace that can be the salvation for the sinner today. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9 it says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This was a direct rebuke to the church at the time of the Reformation. They were indeed teaching doctrines when it was only the word of God that could bring salvation. When that time comes, when all of us will stand before the bar of God, when we will be standing in judgment, as it were, we will have nothing else that we can stand on apart from the grace of God and the righteousness of Christ. There were two key elements to the Protestant Reformation, and these have now been fully developed. First of all, there was protest. 
protesting what was wrong in the church, the fact that the Bible was being hidden, it was being kept chained to the pulpit in a language that people could not understand. Luther, he got to the point where he was going to translate the Bible. And when we look at the next episode in this series, we will see at Luther's contribution to the spread of the Bible. But for this evening, we're looking at the fact that Luther was able to stand up and protest. He was able to see something that was wrong and protest against it. Secondly, the second part is in the name of the Reformation. It was calling for a reform. The church had been degrading from the time of Christ, since the apostles themselves had died. The church had been degrading into the works and the thoughts and the teachings of men. It needed a reform that would bring the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the Bible, back into the heart of the human being. So people like Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, Hus, Jerome, and now we're looking at Martin Luther. These are the people that would bring Reformation into the Christian life. And this Reformation would continue, not just for the the time of that century, of the 16th century, but even into the 19th century, the Reformation continued. And I would go so far as to say it continues today, even though many of the Reformed churches are no longer following that Reformation, still there is a Reformation to be found, if nowhere else it's found in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. Because we hold on to the teachings of the Reformation and then add the final touches to the Reformation as as our church comes into existence in the 19th century. Christ is calling each one of us. Man-made doctrines will not save us, only the blood of Jesus Christ. And by coming to Christ we find true salvation and real hope for the sinner. So let us continue to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ on a daily basis so that his grace may be sufficient for each one of us to ensure and reassure us of not just salvation but our place in the heavenly kingdom. And may God bless us to this end. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.